matrix on the finite integral as a as a thermal field double with respect not to the it's with respect to a to a, a symmetry that does this, which is not an ordinary boost, but it's the thing that it's the thing that would conformally map to. Mm. We had a homework problem. Yeah, you had a homework problem about this. Yeah. And so you get the same entropy if you think of if you think of it that way. If you think of like starting with the regular results. And no. Yeah. Notice we did not calculate the entropy by first doing the density matrix and then calculate yeah. the entropy. But if you did it that way, then yes. Yeah. It's a little tricky to deal with the UV divergences if you try to do it by that direct method, though. So on the half line, you just create a thermal uh, entropy, right? So then we have to trans. So you're saying we have to transform that to this. That is tricky. Well, the, on the half line, the, the entropy is infinite. Oh, okay, there. Okay, there we have to regulate. Yeah. yeah. So there. The, yeah. Um, but what I was just referring to was, the, I think you asked me last time, like, yeah. can we just take the expectation value of log rho? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And. I think you should be able to do that, but it's just tricky to deal with the divergences and stuff. Is this going? Yes. Okay. Um, what is going on here? I don't know. <laughs> the projectors are on. There's a button over there. Can I switch off? It says off, but it's obviously not off. So what if you hit off again? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, quick reminder, final project topics are due tomorrow. So um, right now I have five people who have picked a topic. Um, I'm expecting a few more, so please talk to me. Um, and if you, so talk to me either after class or find me in my office, or if that doesn't work, then send me an email and we can figure it out over email. Um, so the topic today is Generalized entropy. Okay, so we've discussed. Um, is this? Is there something? It's blurry. <laughs> it's, it's not, not focusing. focusing. If I stand here, like. Uh, yeah, you have to wait. Okay. Oh, now it's good. Yeah. <laughs> See. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Okay, so we talked about general properties of quantum information uh, in Hawking radiation. Then we did some calculations on entanglement and quantum field theory. And now we're working on putting things together and, and talking about entanglement and information in quantum gravity. And the next step in our in in this is to talk about generalized entropy, which I have talked I have mentioned this before, but I'm going to do this in more detail and more systematically now. Um, so and I'm going to derive it. So the definition of generalized entropy uh, is. In a situation where you have black holes, um, we're going to think of the region outside the black hole is out. And the definition of generalized entropy is S gen is equal to one quarter of the area of the black hole plus S out. Um, so in this expression, S out. Okay, and, and this is pretty tricky and subtle, exactly what people mean by generalized entropy. So, because it kind of changes. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to be careful about exactly which one I mean. Um, but for now, um, S out is the von Neumann entropy of the quantum field theory um, in the subregion, which is the outside region of the black hole. Outside the black hole. Um, now, when I say quantum field theory, um, what I mean is uh, the full theory treated perturbatively. Okay, so quantum field theory 
by quantum field theory, I mean all the quantum fields, like scalar fields, et cetera, but also the graviton. Okay, so quantum field theory, including graviton, um, treated as just a perturbative quantum field expanded around some background. So you just treat that as a spin two field and you include it. Um, so this is S of uh, S, the von Neumann entropy of rho in region out. And that's just the ordinary density matrix of the quantum fields. Now, sometimes S uh, out is coarse grain. Okay, so in different discussions of generalized entropy, sometimes people are referring to the to S out being the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields. Other times they mean more of a thermodynamic entropy. Now, as we've discussed, the von Neumann entropy um, often includes a piece that is the thermodynamic entropy, um, but they're a little different. Okay, so we have to be careful which one we're talking about. Um, but I'll define when I when I write some. Some, when I give the, I'm going to give a derivation of some properties of the generalized entropy, and then I'll be more careful about exactly which one I mean. The most interesting, or I don't know if that's the most interesting, a very interesting property of the generalized entropy uh, is that the generalized entropy is UV finite at horizons. Uh, so. Roughly speaking, the way to think about this is the following. Uh, S gen is A over 4 G Newton. When I wrote the formula a minute ago, I, I had set G Newton to 1. So let me put back in that G Newton um, plus S out. Now, S out is the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields. Uh, let, me, let me specify that. For this discussion, I'm really talking about the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields. Um, which, so we know the structure of, of entanglement. This is an entanglement entropy, a von Neumann entropy. And we know the structure of uh, von Neumann entropy in quantum field theory is that it's UV divergent. And the UV, di the divergence in S out comes from the short distance stuff across the horizon. So the reason it's, it's, the reason it's divergent is because there's, a arbitra there's entanglement in all modes across the horizon to arbitrarily short distances. So the leading divergence is an area term. Now, in, in this area term, the, the uh, divergence is set by the UV cutoff uh, to the appropriate power. And then there are subleading divergences, dot, dot, dot. And then there are finite terms. OK. But um, so this doesn't look finite. It looks awfully infinite. Um, but um, the point is that if you treat, that you should think of this, if we wrote the formula this way, you should think of this as the bare Newton's constant. That bare Newton's constant gets renormalized by a large amount by the quantum fields. Uh, and the renormalization of Newton's constant cancels this UV divergence. Let me write a formula. So this is. On this G Newton over here, I'm going to put a zero for band. Okay, so in terms of the normalized Newton's constant, it's A over 4G renormalized plus a finite QFT part. I'm going to give an example in a second, but that's that's 
uh, what we believe happens. I say it's what we believe happens um, because uh, this has really only been done in detail in a few examples, like free scalars. Uh, people have tried to do it for free gauge fields. That took like 40 years to get the calculation. I mean, that's a that's an extremely subtle calculation. Um, but I, my understanding is this has now been straightened out, just like in the last few years. It took many, many years to, to get that right. But ultimately, uh, the UV divergences did cancel in that calculation. Um, but we think it's always true, and I'll give a, I'll give a, uh, a formal reason for, for, for believing this uh, when we derive a generalized entropy. Um, to give some more detail about uh, what this looks like, I want to tell you, um, I want to write down some formulas in two dimensions. Okay, so in, if, if we're in two dimensions, so say we have a black hole, and um, we want to calculate the generalized entropy. Well, we have a bit of an issue in that S out is always going to be infinite. So remember that the, uh, that the um, binomial entropy, say we're doing a CFT. This is, so this is gravity plus CFT. Uh, for example, it could be free fields. Okay, so the CFT, S, the contribution of the CFT to the binomial entropy is logarithmic in the system size. That's the calculation we did last time. Uh, so everything is infinite. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put an IR cutoff uh, by putting a point x2 right here. And um, then we're just going to calculate the um, generalized entropy of this region. So what do I, maybe I'll call this region something. Let's call this whole region A. And we, I want to write down the formula for the generalized entropy of region A. So the generalized entropy of region A is defined to be uh, the area of all the black holes in region A. In this case, there's one black hole. OK, so let's call this point here x1. Uh, so it's the area of the point x1 over 4 g newton bare um, plus the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields that are in region A but outside the black hole. Okay, so we'll call this region here out. Okay, so plus uh, c over 6 log x2 minus x1 squared over epsilon 1, epsilon 2. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but this is the contribution of the conformal field theory to S out. So this is S of rho out of the conformal field theory. That's a calculation we did last time, except that I've, I have this epsilon 1, epsilon 2. Um, the reason there's an epsilon 1, epsilon 2 is because last time we talked about the conformal field theory of flat space. Now we're talking about a conformal field theory of curved space. What that does is it effectively changes the, uh, the UV cutoffs that you have to put in. I don't want to get into that right now, so just, just believe me that it, it changes those UV cutoffs a little bit. Uh, so that's the contribution of the conformal field theory. And then there's a plus gravitons term. Which I'm not going to worry about. Um, now, the bare Newton's constant is UV divergent. And we have UV divergences from the CFT, from the entropy. Um, so, what happens is that when you renormalize, you get area of X1 over 4G Newton 
that's now the renormalized Newton's constant. I'm not going to keep writing renormalized. We just write Newton's constant. We always mean the renormalized one. Um, plus c over 6 log. Um, and what happens is that, well, it roughly speaking cancels off the divergence. But we can't just delete it. A log won't make any sense because it'll have a dimensions problem, it'll have a units problem. If we just delete it. So we know what's going to happen is that the uh, renormalization scale has to enter in place of the UV cutoff. So the renormalization scale is going to enter in place of the UV cutoff at the horizon. There's also a UV cutoff contribution, a UV contribution from the point X2. That's still there. That's still UV divergent. So we haven't we haven't done it. We haven't included any area term or anything at x2. So that's just still UV divergent. Uh, but that really has nothing to do with the black hole. So we don't really care. Uh, it's not going to bother us. Uh, that term is just still there. And then there's the plus gravitons. Um, but the UV divergence, the gravitons will have a similar situation where they have a UV divergence at the horizon. Um, so let me call it gravitons renormalized, because uh, it'll have the same effect there where the, the divergence at the horizon gets replaced by the RG scale. Yeah? Does gravity have a negative beta function? Does gravity have a negative beta function? Well, let's see. Gravity gets strong at high energies. OK, so I'm, I'm just confused so no. because it seems like it's one over G Newton that has a UV divergence rather than G Newton. Uh, it's negative. The this is this is this is so if if you the UV divergence here is plus infinity, and the UV divergence of one over G Newton is minus infinity, and that minus infinity cancels this plus infinity. So that means G Newton like goes to zero as you. As you increase your cutoff, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by well, that. Because one over G Newton is divergent. Right. So G Newton is going to zero. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by going. Because you increase the cutoff. Uh, well, if you if you integrate out some quantum fields. They give you a minus, inf uh, if, you, if you have some, so the point is you, you have gravity plus some quantum fields. When you integrate out those quantum fields, 1 over G Newton gets a, a negative infinity shift. It's a shift by negative infinity. Sorry. The epsilon one and epsilon two cut off, so they. Oh, epsilon one is the is the UV cutoff uh, that comes from this point, and epsilon two is the UV cutoff at this point. Remember that when we calculated entanglement entropy in CFT, it was sensitive to these UV cutoffs. In the CFT calculation we did last time, it was in flat space and there was just one epsilon, um, but in in curved space that gets changed a little bit. Other questions? Yeah. High dimensions, what about the sublimit? Why is it high? Um, good question. I think it's also, I think it's fully finite in all dimensions. All the subleading terms will also get canceled. Um, I don't think that's been shown, although I'm not sure. Uh, but the reason I think. It's UV. The reason I think it, it's finite is because of the, the formal uh, derivation we're going to give in a minute. Um, the, the, what makes this all very subtle, and the reason these calculations are so difficult and, and it took so long for people to converge on the answer for, for gauge theory, is that the meaning of entanglement entropy is, is, is not. So entanglement entropy is 
is not a unique notion in a theory with, with gauge symmetries or diffeomorphisms, so with gravity. Um, you have to say what you're doing with the modes that, that straddle the, the cutoff surface, because the Hilbert space doesn't really factorize. And uh, put it this way, I think, I think the true statement is that there's a way of defining the entanglement entropy um, such that the generalized entropy is finite. There exists a scheme in which, in which it's finite. What does it cancel with? Like, the graph? Oh, it's still it's still canceling with the one over G Newton. It's just further. It's just subleading terms in the renormalization of Newton's constant. But those terms don't scale with area, right? So how how is it? How do they also renormalize Newton's constant? Well, I I think. Okay, I don't really know the answer. I'm, not, I've never, I don't, I'm not even aware of someone doing this calculation. Maybe it's been done. I'm not aware of it. But if I had to guess, um, you know, area is is really an operator, and we're we're calculating expectation value of that operator. And and you probably, if you start worrying about the subleading divergences, I think you're really going to have to worry about that. Yeah. So when you say the S gen is UV finite at the horizon, in on a generic outside it's sorry, for a generic region, would this be like an upper bound that's still finite? What's an upper bound? Just the right hand side of that equation. Just, just, just the Which equation? So S gen equals A over four G Newton plus S out. If this were a black hole horizon, uh, and you were just looking at the Beckett seam bound or something, you'd still have the right hand side which would be the upper bound and that's still it would be a finite upper bound or something? I don't know what you mean by upper bound. That's just a definition of the generalized entropy. It's the it's the black hole entropy plus the quantum field entropy. That's just the definition. So that's so, so that's for you know for a horizon for a black hole. Right? I'm saying if you had if you had some other region that's not a black hole, yeah. and you were looking at and you were trying to define an S gen for that, or sorry, what am I saying? I guess I'm just trying to say that the Beckett seam bound is is an upper bound for generic regions, right? So. Do you mean the Beck? There's different Bekenstein bounds. Are you talking about the the bound that the entropy is less than area before? Yeah. Um, okay, that's that's different from what we're talking about here. Okay, so that doesn't get generalized in this way or something. For, for, I, I just mean like, what uh, is there a version of this for non-black hole regions or for regions that are not inside horizons? Yeah, there's. I guess. I guess maybe the question is whether you can assign an entropy to 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 regions when the cutoff is not a black hole. But but I just like I don't know. I just take a, take some region and I declare that I'm like not going to look in there. Can I assign a generalized entropy to this? And um, the answer is no, as far as we know. I mean, there are suggestive reasons to think that there's an entropy associated to any surface, including this one, which goes as area. Um, but there's no like S gen, and it's not going to obey the second law that I'm about to write. And, okay. and So the generalized second law, or GSL, uh, is a conjecture uh, that states that the generalized entropy of the universe, uh, which is the sum over all the black holes of the area over 4, uh, plus S out, where that means outside of all the black holes um, is increasing in all physical processes, d by dt of 
as the gen is positive. Um, there's a subtlety in what's meant by this formula. And people don't usually talk about the subtlety, but I'm going to try to talk about it. So the subtlety is that um, is what we mean by S out in this, in, in this statement of the GSL. Um, so, and the, the reason to see that there's a subtlety is, okay, the, the ordinary second law is not really a statement about fine-grained entropies. The ordinary second law is a statement about thermodynamic entropies or coarse-grained entropies. And so it would be a little weird to have a fine-grained entropy showing up in the second law, right? Um, so um, I think the clearest way to say it is that this conjecture is supposed to hold uh, for S out either um, coarse-grained Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what coarse graining I'm going to use here, but I mean, for example, if we have a cup of tea outside a black hole, then that's like a hot thing as a temperature and a thermodynamic entropy. That's the entropy you're supposed to use in the second law, the generalized second law. It's the ordinary entropy. That you, the, so in that case, S out is the entropy that you would use in, this, in the ordinary second law for the ordinary matter. It's that coarse grain entropy. There are different ways of coarse graining that give you slight variations on that second law, but we intuitively know what we mean by that coarse graining. Um, or uh, a fine grain uh, that is a von Neumann entropy calculated in perturbative um, quantum gravity plus quantum field. By perturbative, what I mean is, there's parentheses. The quantum gravity is being treated perturbatively, and the quantum field theory is being treated exactly. OK, so. Um, let me give an example. This is confusing. So let, let me give an example. So uh, the example is uh, black hole evaporation. OK, so if we plot, let's look at the page curve again. So we're, when a black hole evaporates, um, Hawking calculated the entropy of the, of the radiation and found this curve that has a paradox in it. So Hawking's calculation looks something like this. So this is S out according to Hawking. Um, Then we can look at the area of the black hole. As we talked about before, this is the area over four of the black hole as it evaporates. And now I want to plot the generalized entropy. OK, so the generalized entropy, let's take generalized entropy to be the sum of these curves temporarily. And that's, what, that's, the, right, that's the right notion of generalized entropy in this case, which I'll explain. But, so the generalized entropy um, does something like this. Which is just the sum of these two curves. And the statement of the GSL is that, is that it looks the way I drew it. Okay, if you actually plot the curves, the statement of the GSL is that this does not you know, do something like that uh, and come back down. It's monotonically increasing. So this has d by dt of s gen is uh, non-negative. It's 
So that's the statement of the generalized second law for black hole evaporation. Now, where does the subtlety come in? Well, what do we really mean by S out of Hawking? Or what do we really mean by S out? If, if we mean Hawking's, so one way of saying is it is the thermal entropy of the radiation. Hawking radiation is thermal, and we just calculate the coarse grain thermal entropy of that thermal radiation at some temperature. That's what Hawking's calculation gives. Um, so that's interpreting the generalized entropy with a coarse graining on S out. Another way we could say it is that Hawking did a calculation in perturbative quantum gravity. He just calculated the density matrix of the radiation. Um, so that's like option two. It's the von Neumann entropy of the, of the radiation as calculated uh, by, by Hawking's kind of procedure. And the reason I have to be careful about this is because we don't actually think that this is the right answer for the fine grain entropy of the radiation. Right? We think that the true fine grain entropy of the radiation goes up and then down. Um, and if we were to use the true, believed to be true, fine grain entropy of the radiation in the, in the GSL, it would be violated. That's because the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply to fine grain entropies. Okay? So you have, to, you have to use an approximate entropy which has either been coarse grained or been calculated in perturbative quantum gravity. I think this is really fascinating and intriguing because it's already suggesting, and we haven't gotten, we haven't done any wormholes or anything. But this is really, it's already suggesting that when we think about perturbative quantum gravity, uh, we're doing a coarse graining. That it's 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 not calculating fine grain entropies for some reason, that uh, some reason to be determined. But it's doing some kind of coarse graining because otherwise it just would not makes sense to be getting a second law out of it. Yeah. Um, so two questions. One is, should these things, well, I guess you're implying that these things always agree, or is the statement just that they both monotonically increase? Um, I think that they agree in the regime where they both make sense. And that they both, it, it could be that there's some variation, some slight variations in definitions and that they all obey the, the second law. This is true also in ordinary thermodynamics that, that there are slightly different formulations of the second law that are true. Um, I think that might be the case here, but in the examples I can think of, um, like dropping a cup of tea into a black hole, you could do either one and, and the dominant terms agree and, and they both give you the second law. Um, and then, I forgot my question. Okay, are there other questions? Yeah. So is it, is it correct to think of the fine grain entropy as being a sum of the, the coarse grain, which is kind of like thermal, thrown down out quantity, plus uh, vacuum correlations, stuff outside the system. That's that's true in cases where the correlations are with an except with an outside. So, if you have a a region A, and you're in a quantum state that where like this is entangled with this, and, and this is entangled with that, and then what you just said is true. That you can think of the fine grain entropy as a sum of the, the thermodynamic coarse grain part and some UV divergences at the edges. When it's not true is when the correlations are within region A. So if there are correlations like this, this would contribute two to the thermodynamic entropy and zero to the fine grain entropy. Um, so that's the kind of situation where, well, that's what we think is going to happen with the radiation, with the Hawking radiation, that it's going to have some subtle correlations amongst the radiation. So um, in that case, the fine grain entropy is lower than the coarse grain entropy. Sorry, 
Why? Why? So in the second case, it, it's just thermodynamic. The so fine grain? Or sorry, the. Uh, yeah. The fine grain entropy, um, the, well, the contribution of this pair to the fine grain entropy is zero. Yes. But its contribution to the thermodynamic ah. entropy is two. Because ah, in I the see. thermodynamic entropy, you don't notice these subtle correlations. Okay. So when you have correlations, uh, when, you, when basically the way to think about it is that when a system purifies itself through its correlations, the fine grain entropy is lower than the thermodynamic entropy. Now, I have to be a little careful what I mean by lower because there's still this infinite factor uh, from the UV divergences. But um, what I mean is that the, the non-divergent part is smaller than the thermodynamic part here, whereas here, the, the non-divergent part is equal to the thermodynamic part. And by coarse grain entropy, we still mean, like, you just find the um, thermal state that has the same entropy, or sorry, the same thermal state that has the same energy as the actual state, and then calculate its fine grain entropy. Um, that's the simplest thing we could mean. Uh, I think that we have to be a little bit more general here to allow for the fact that, like, it's not necessarily an equilibrium. It could be that there's, like, a cup of tea. <laughs> um, my favorite example, that, that it's not, like, an equilibrium. There's just a cup of tea that's at some temperature, but the rest of space is not at that temperature. Or we could have like one hot cup of tea and one less hot cup of tea. So we have to allow for situations like that. It's more like a hydrodynamic entropy in that case. Um, was it still just you compute the expectation value of the Hamiltonian and then you find your period? Yeah, the base, basically a coarse grain entropy always means that you pick some set of coarse grain observables. Like it could be total energy, that's what we do in thermodynamics, or it could be uh, local energy density. That's more like what we do in hydrodynamics, where, where you can have energy and temperature, fluctu temperature differences. Um, so you pick some coarse grained, you pick some set of observables, which you consider the, the coarse grained observables, and then you maximize the fine grain, you maximize the fine grained entropy uh, over all states that have the correct coarse grained observables. So a, a choice of, of Observables defines for you a choice of coarse graining. Uh, so, Tom? Yeah. In the first case, you said the fine grain entropy is the thermodynamic entropy plus those correlations across the boundary. Yeah. So, but uh, shouldn't we have the coarse grain entropy to always be greater than the fine grain entropy? Yeah. That okay. That that depends a little bit on. Sorry. There's. The problem is there's kind of three different things. <laughs> so the let's write some formulas because this gets very confusing. Okay, so um, there's a fine grain entropy, um, which is just the von Neumann entropy of the exact state rho n. There's a coarse grain entropy, which is the max over all rho tilde, um, such that the such that some choice of observables in the state rho tilde agree up to some error with observables in the state rho uh, over s. Well, I know I'm on uh, rho tilde a. Well, why do you allow for the error? Sorry? Why do you stay up to some error? Don't we usually? Uh, well, when we when we fix the no, maybe we don't. I, I don't. Maybe we don't need that. Uh, well, it depends what the observables are, but um, we should only pick. Just think about think about thermodynamics, where you you only pick some macroscopic observables. So O has to be sort of a macroscopic observable. OK. Now, I agree that this one is always bigger than that one. But then there's the thermal entropy uh, of, this, of this region, 
And by that, I just mean the volume of the region times um, the thermal entropy density, uh, the temperature uh, at the temperature that has the correct energy density. So um, this is a finite quantity. This is like the extent. So the way to think of it is that um, the coarse grain is bigger than the fine grained. And the thermodynamic entropy is the extensive part of the coarse grain entropy. It's missing the UV divergence because it's just picking up the extensive part. And when we talk about um, the second law, the generalized second law, um, sometimes people are talking about thermodynamic entropy. Sometimes they're talking about the coarse grain entropy. And other times they're talking about a fine grain entropy calculated perturbatively. They're never talking about the exact fine grain entropy, because then it would be wrong. So the middle one does have it, you said it does have a unit B diverging part. Yeah, it does, because this is, this is by construction, it's always, in, it's all, well, these, this is over states which are reasonable quantum states, and all reasonable quantum states have the have that UV divergence. So the difference between the third line and the second line there is that like saying that if I just have a thermal density matrix, like rho is e to the minus beta h, and I computed the von Neumann entropy of that thing, it's not the same thing as the thermal dynamic entropy. Correct. Only the extensive part would agree. We checked that, actually, we did that for a 2D CFT um, at some point. This is specific to field theory, though. Like, if I were in some other quantum mechanical system and I did that, then they would agree, right? No. Because they would only agree in the extensive part. It's, it, it's, it's not that they're disagreeing. It's just that they're defined a little bit differently. Uh, the, it's only the, the thermodynamic entropy density is, like by definition, the part that's extensive in the system size. And this thing includes edge effects. Okay, so, so it won't agree, even like for a quantum mechanical spin chain. It includes the edge, it includes this, the edge effects. So what is the density matrix which maximizes that? It's like thermal plus some, something else? I think if we if we really wanted to do this yeah. carefully, yeah. Um, let's see. What if, it, what if it was just like a high heat or something? So we'd have to be very careful about what we're maximizing over here, because we don't want to maximize over stuff with like crazy UV correlations. We won't only want to maximize over states restricted to some reasonableness conditions. Um, but I think if we did that correctly, then this coarse grain entropy would just be the, the von Neumann entropy of the thermal state, reduced to region A. If, if, we're, if, the, if, the, if the coarse grain, if our coarse graining was defined by fixing energy, I think we would end up with the um, von Neumann entropy of region A. It might depend a little bit on the details of how we did the coarse graining and, and the, the um, maximization procedure, but certainly its extensive part would be this. These are all like good, important subtleties, um, but I guess what, what you should get out of this is, is not that there's like 10 different second laws, what you should get out of it is that um, you have to worry about the precise definitions and the UV divergences, and then talk about quantities that are not sensitive to them. That's, that's kind of the message that you should get out of it here. And um, there, yeah. You just have to be careful exactly which one you're talking about. But what usually happens if you define everything correctly is that um, once you include all the, once you're careful about it, all reasonable definitions 
give you a good definition of, of entropy in this case. Um, maybe we should keep going. And I, so I was, let's see, we could eat, we could, um, I was going to prove the second law. Um, yeah, let's do it because I think this will clarify. I think this will clarify the, all the definitions and everything, and it'll give us a case where it's crystal clear exactly what what's being stated and claimed. Okay. So, um, I'm going to prove. So this is Aaron Wall's proof of the generalized second law, uh, which is really a beautiful combination of quantum information techniques and, and black hole information. It was one of the early ones, kind of before this was popular, so it's especially nice. Um, the assumptions, that it's not totally general, so the, the assumptions, it's not, it's not a complete proof of the generalized second law. Um, but it applies in lots of situations. Um, and I'm just going to give a, a sketch of how this proof goes. And, and um, some, of the, some of the details are filled in in the uh, handwritten notes that are going to be posted on the web page. Um, because the first time I wrote these notes, I realized it was going to take an extra lecture. So I'm going to skip part of it, but it's still in the notes. Um, and just kind of focus on the quantum information part. Okay, so here's the setup. Same as four, basically. Okay, we have a black hole. Um, and we want to compare the generalized entropy on slice one to the generalized entropy on slice two. And we want to show that it increases. Um, now, as I said before, ah, and this is not a static black hole. You should imagine that there's like Uh, which is falling in the black hole. Um, and the, there's gravitational back reaction when the cup of tea falls in. Um, so we have to keep track of all that. It's not that we're studying a, a, a static or stationary black hole. We're really looking at um, stuff falling into a black hole and including all the quantum effects and calculating the generalized entropy. Um, Okay, as, as in our, when we discussed it before, um, all these generalized entropies are going to be infinite because of infrared divergences, because space is infinitely big. Um, so that's not a problem. Um, you just have to imagine that we really put an infrared cutoff out here somewhere. I'm not going to keep track of that infrared cutoff throughout the calculation. It just, it's not time dependent, and we're looking at the the time derivative, so it's not going to matter. Okay. Questions about the setup? Uh, are you only assuming asymptotically flat uh, cases, or it's general? Um, it's general. Um, I believe it's general, although in the paper he's talking about asymptotically flat, so I, I have to think about it, but I believe it's general. Yeah. Okay, so um, first I want to think about, okay, so S gen, we're trying to show S gen increases, so this is 1 over 4 G Newton times the area plus S out. And in this derivation, for this whole discussion, S out is the, uh, is the true von Neumann entropy. 
uh, but as calculated in, in perturbative quantum gravity, which just means uh, if you, which just, just means how people always do calculations in quantum field theory and curve space, but not including any wormholes or anything, any, anything like that. Okay. Um, so first of all, let's think about the area of the black hole. So the area, this is the event horizon. Along the event horizon, uh, the area of the black hole depends on some parameter lambda that labels where we are along the horizon. And the Ray Chaudhuri equation um, gives you the following. So I, this is the part I'm going to skip. So um, The Ray Chaudhuri equation, if you recall, is an equation for the derivative of the expansion. That is, for a second derivative of the area. Those are quotes and those are primes. Okay. The Ray Chaudhuri <laughs> equation is an equation for area prime prime, roughly speaking. Okay, now I'm going to skip some steps and just tell you what that equation says. What you could do is you could take this area prime prime equation and integrate it twice to derive an equation for the area. And here's what you get. A of lambda is a constant. That constant actually is area at infinity, but we won't need that, because it came from integrating this equation twice. Minus 8 pi g Newton uh, integral Uh, d, d minus 2y perp, integral d lambda prime from lambda to infinity, lambda prime minus lambda. Why are we integrating twice if we want to get that? Um, you'll see. <laughs> um, T K K of lambda prime y perp expectation value, where K is the uh, tangent vector along the horizon. Okay, so I didn't derive that. It's in the notes, um, but just to convince you that this is reasonable, the Ray Chaudhuri equation is like area prime prime is a stress tensor. Okay, so you can imagine that integrating it would give some integral of the stress tensor, uh, and this is what it gives. Um, now, this is very interesting uh, because this quantity appear so this quantity appearing on the right hand side uh, is actually the boost charge. Uh, which I'll call expectation value k of lambda. So let me explain what I mean by that boost charge. Um, let's look, say, at this slice here. Then if we zoom in on the horizon, there's a locally flat patch on the horizon that we can look at. Uh, and there are boosts. There's, we can define a boost uh, along that horizon. Okay, and um, so this thing is the is lambda times t is the is the current is the corresponding current that generates that boost. Okay, so this thing appearing in here is the boost charge. Uh, and now if I write a derivative, what we've derived is that d by d lambda of the area of a of lambda is minus 8 pi g newton times d by d lambda of the boost charge.
Okay, so that's the part that um, I was just sketching, and now I'm going to go to the. So that that's just some nice way of of writing the Einstein equation that tells you how the area changes along this horizon. Now we're going to go to the quantum information. So the trick uh, is to think about the relative entropy of the quantum fields in the background of this black hole. So remember that the relative entropy S of rho slash sigma uh, is trace rho log rho minus trace of rho log sigma. So the way to think about this is that sigma is some reference state, and you're, me you're measuring how distinguishable rho is from that reference state. We can write this. The first term is just negative of the binomial entropy of rho. And uh, the second term is, let me write this way, as minus log sigma in the state row. Now, for our purposes, uh, let the reference state, sigma, um, to be the Hartle-Hawking state. That is, this is the quantum state of the fields. Uh, this is the quantum state that corresponds to the black hole just being stationary. Don't, you don't throw in the cup of tea. This is, not, this is not the actual physical state. This is the reference state. And we're going to compare the state with the tea falling in to the state without the tea falling in. Okay. So this is our reference state. Um, now. If we take the hartle harming state and we reduce it to the out region, the reduced density matrix on the out region is the thermal state. That's the whole point of Hawking radiation and the hartle harking state is that uh, that's the thermal state. Okay, so sigma out is um, thermal with respect to boosts. So this is going to be, we're going to use this as our reference state, and now um, that means that S, so rho is the physical state, so this is the real state, with the T falling in and everything. So S of rho slash sigma is, uh, sorry, rho out slash sigma out is minus S of rho out. Um, minus the second term, which is just 2 pi expectation value of k lambda in the state row. And what we showed uh, on the other board is that this boost charge is related to the horizon area. So this is minus s of rho out plus or minus um, 1 over 4 g Newton times the area at time lambda uh, plus a constant. Now, 
Now the generalized second law is the monotonicity of relative, the monotonicity of relative entropy. So the monotonicity of relative entropy uh, says that d by d lambda s of rho out slash sigma out is less than zero. The reason for that, so I, I stated this before, but let me convince you again that this is a true and reasonable equation. Okay, so uh, d by d lambda is, d by d lambda shrinks the region. So when we, when we slide up the point along the horizon, the region gets smaller. So this is a shrinking, this shrinks the region out that we have access to. And if you have two quantum states and you're asking how easily you can distinguish them, well, if you shrink, if you have, if you hide part of the region, it can only get harder. So it can only get harder to, to distinguish them, the relative entropy uh, therefore has to go down. So this is the monotonicity of relative entropy. And um, if we now plug in our formula for relative entropy here, it says that uh, d by d lambda of area lambda plus s of rho out is positive. And therefore, we've shown that in this case, the generalized second law is the monotonicity of relative entropy. Sorry, you said when you evolve in lambda, the out region is shrinking. Is that Yes, that follows from the picture. If we, if we move this point up, yeah. then uh, the out region is, I mean, we can think of, so the out region at time two, um, like the, the out region at time one, is basically this segment union the out region at time two. Okay, so we can think of going to later times as, as tracing stuff out. Uh, yeah. Can you remind us like what the general version of monotonicity and relative entropy is? I mean, I remember like there's a monotonicity. Of... Well, the the general version involves quantum channels. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, I've only used here a, a version that, that's under partial trace. So the version here that I've used is S of rho AB, sigma AB is greater than S of rho A, sigma A. That is that partial trace can only decrease the relative entropy. And why is like going forward on lambda the same as a partial trace? Um, good, let me draw another picture. So this is region out at time lambda one. This is region out at time lambda two. And uh, let's call this region here um, B, which is that segment of the horizon there. Now, since we're talking, so um, S of rho out lambda one, is equal to S of rho 
B union out lambda 2. Um, that's because evolving by time is a unitary operation that doesn't change the uh, von Neumann entropy. Uh, that's true, except B isn't at the same time as I do those. Well, imagine evolving like this. Okay. That's a unitary operation in a relativistic quantum field theory. Okay. Um, so we can evolve to, to here, and then we trace out B. Isn't B supposed to be timeline? No, B is the horizon. It's null. No. Or sorry, null. B is null. So yeah. it can't be like at the same time as out lambda 2. It, here's the time slice. It is at the same time. Doesn't that red line that you, have, that you just drew have to be like spatial? So it can't include like this null line? Well, you worried about, I mean, you're worried about the fact, I mean, it's, you can approach it with space-like surfaces. If you're worried about some order of limits as you take the limit from a space-like surface becoming null, um, it doesn't matter. We, we, could, we could move this point a Planck length outside the horizon, if you prefer. And then all these surfaces would be space-like. Well, that's the okay. So we are allowed to. We, you you are allowed to set, in a relativistic theory, you are allowed to draw spatial slices that that have null segments, and all the usual entanglement inequalities and stuff still apply when you when you separate stuff that way. You don't have to worry about like, divergences. Well, it depends on exactly what you're calculating. Sometimes you do have to worry about stuff like that. Um, for, the, for our purposes, just partial trace of the, 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 the relative entropy um, that we're calculating is UV finite, so we don't get into trouble with that. That's a nice, one of the nice things about using the, the relative entropy here instead of, the, instead of talking about binomial entropies is that the UV divergences cancel. because it's saying if you restrict yourself just to the region outside the horizon, then that's, that unitarity evolves by itself, even if it looks on the other side of the horizon. No. No, the, this, this region outside evolves unitarily only if you keep track of everything that's falling into the horizon, which is region B. So the evolution from out, out lambda 1 to the union, that's unitary. Because you didn't, you didn't lose track of anything. You kept track of all the stuff falling out. But if you just, the evolution of the outside alone is like a, is like a, is like a partial trace. Right. And also, I mean, it's a unitary followed by a partial trace. When you said this calculation is done for curvature quantum gravity, does that mean you're accounting for back and that kind of stuff? Or? Yes. So the metric changes and the metric changes that that was included in in the. The fact that we use the Rachidur equation to look at the change in the area, all the back reaction on the metric was included. So this is valid to all orders in general? No, this is valid. Um, so the way the argument goes, and this part, this includes part of the part I, I skipped over, is that so if the First, there's the area theorem. Okay, so the Richardary equation implies the area theorem that, that the classical area alone increases. Now, if you're in a situation where the classical area is increasing, then uh, you don't really have to calculate. You don't like you could just stop that because uh, what we're doing is we're trying to look at the quantum corrections on top of that. Um, so, if that's your leading term, then um, you're done. Um, and we want to look at perturbative quantum corrections on top of that, so we can restrict to situations where the classical area theorem is saturated, that is, the classical area is unchanging, um, and that therefore, like in these equations that I was writing,
think you should think of we're working in an approximation where everything in this equation is order h bar. So we've taken some some eight order h bar because we're dropping in some quantum matter. Um, so there's an h bar, and it's back reacting at order h bar. So the area is changing at order h bar, um, and so it's true in this approximation. So how should I proceed if I want to do it at the higher orders? That is a great question. Um, I would say that it's not clear how to proceed or whether there should even be a statement at, in, in the totally nonlinear case. Okay, so if you want to go, if you, so the, the second law of thermodynamics, it's not clear what the second of thermodynamics is supposed to mean. The second law of thermodynamics would be in situations that are totally away from equilibrium. That's the statement even about StatMech, that um, it's, not, it's not clear that there's a quantity that's a function of time that decreases monotonically in situations that go far from equilibrium. Um, so it's not clear that there should be something like that here. Uh, now, what should give you pause is that actually the area theorem is true. <laughs> the classical area theorem bizarrely is true arbitrarily far from equilibrium. So you might expect a quantum version that's also true, um, but I'm not aware of one. So this is like solving the Einstein equation, but with g equal to expectation value of stress tensor, right? The, g, what's g? Uh, the Einstein tensor equal to. That's right. Yeah. That's right. This came from, yeah. So can I not do that procedure iteratively to go to higher orders? Well, yeah, you can do it order by order in perturbation theory. Yeah. Um, I guess you could ask, I mean, if, if at any point it's not saturated, then you're done, right? The next order term is smaller. But I guess you could, you could ask, well, what if the order h bar term is exactly saturated? Then you could ask about the order h bar squared term and whether the theorem is true there. And I've never thought about that. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Homework problem? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. OK. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, with the rel with the monotonicity of relative density, is there an, it, when we question locality, is there an issue in in even knowing if we can separate the region to A and B. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and, and that's part of the subtlety that I kept emphasizing today, that these statements are statements about perturbative gravity. Um, and just writing, like, calling this region A and, and that region B, or labeling the regions like that, and then, and then using inequalities like this, it's not clear at all that that makes any sense in non-perturbative quantum gravity. Um, I guess one of the problems that people are really working on now is to answer question is basically to answer that question and all the questions that its neighbors on. Is there another question? No. Okay. Don't forget, final projects. Um, talk to me right now, if possible, otherwise by tomorrow.